will every household have their own Star Trek-esque 3D printer for food, medicine and drugs, uh, clothes? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> and, and do you think this is going to implode uh, the economy on Earth? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So, um, so the replicator, it, it poses all sorts of problems for economists. Hello, space enthusiasts. You're now listening to Space Forward Podcast. I'm Hussein Bukhari, your host. With me are Matthias Frenzel and Benjamin Shapiro. In this episode, we'll be diving right into the dynamics of the space sector. Space commerce, space business, space industry, talking about the space market and the fundamental forces driving their development. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Matthew Weinzero, an associate professor in the business government and the international economy unit at Harvard Business School. Matthew has worked for McKinsey and Company and the US government as an economist on the White House Council of Economic Advisors, while much of Professor Weinzero's early research focused on optimal design of economic policy, in particular taxation. He has recently launched an array of projects focused on commercialization of the space sector and its economic implications. Matthew, together with his Harvard Business School team, have published multiple case studies just this past year on SpaceX and economies of scale, along with made in space, business of in-space manufacturing, and all of this along with an article empathetically proclaiming the commercial space age is here in the Harvard Business Review. Hello and a warm welcome to Matthew. You published recently together with the MIT team at the Harvard Business School study on SpaceX and an article in, a, in Harvard Business Review on a space age. Tell me what was the motivation around that article and what led you to, to do it now and not before? Great. Well, first, it's a pleasure to be with all of you guys talking about space. It's always a pleasure. And in particular about space economy, space business. I got interested in the economics of space, the business of space, only about six or seven years ago now, I'm actually trained as a tax economist, a tax theorist, and found my way there through a sort of circuitous route. Um, and, you know, so around 2014 or so, I started digging into this world of commercial space, going to conferences, talking to people, just trying to soak up what was happening, understand what was happening. HBS, one of the nice things about being at HBS is we have this tool of, called case studies where it's not exactly an academic article, it's not journalism, it's somewhere in between, but it's a great way to dig into research topics that are not very well established in the academic literature. And space economics is a great example of that, is very little of it in the academic literature. So, so I talked to lots of companies, tried to learn what was happening, and over the years, the question that kept coming back uh, in terms of the outlook for space business or for a space economy was, where is the demand? Like, why are we going there in the first place? And, and, you know, of course, people have been thinking about different reasons why we might go there for decades. But as I tried to develop my own hypotheses around this, I just sort of went back to basic principles and, and tried to think about what an economy is. Fundamentally, an economy is people transacting. And that leads to the very sort of basic insight that it's going to be hard to have a space economy until you have people in space. And so the point of this article was to kind of say, look, this is a really important moment in the progress of space and commercial space, because now we actually have a private company putting people into space. And that private company doesn't just want to put people in space for public sector reasons, but maybe for their own personal reasons. And that's what will eventually drive economic activity more broadly. So we just wanted to get that thesis out there, have people wrestle with it. It's not, I'm sure it's a thesis many people have had, but I hadn't seen it uh, put forward in, an, in an, a venue like HBR, where maybe some non-traditional people might see it, not just space folks. That's a very well sort of articulation of, of the motivation behind it. You know, something comes to mind, uh, it's a quote by Niels Bohr, the task of science is uh, extend the range of our experience and reduce it to order. 
So I kind of want to bring that back into, into the space sector a little bit here as we're talking about it. Space markets, space commerce, space industry, space sector. What do you mean? You know, I'm, I'm very <laughs> curious about this because is there or will there be such a thing as space commerce or space market at all? And do you believe that? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, really good question. Great place to start, actually. I guess I'd say a couple things first. So, so one funny thing is I like that Niels Bohr quote. I was just, as you were saying it, I just realized one interesting realization I've had as I've been thinking about space economics. It is very much an expansion of the set of things that, say, economists or social scientists in general think about to start thinking about space. On the other hand, one of the things you realize as soon as you start doing it is that the laws or the rules or the principles of economics are basically the same in space. I mean, it's a bit like saying I study Latin American economics or European economics. It's economics just in a different place. So it's not like the fundamental ways that humans interact, uh, which is what the social sciences study, I suppose, change once you move off planet. So, so that is one way that you both expand and reduce it to order, as Niels Bohr said. So that's a nice quote. In terms of your actual question about space commerce, I think about and the article that you mentioned lays this out very clearly, that there is a distinction between what you might think of as space for Earth and space for space. And those are maybe two different economies at some level. Uh, one of them dramatically more well-developed than the other. And that's because if we, think of the, if we think of an economy as essentially being about people transacting with each other, almost all the people are on Earth. So whatever we're doing up in space primarily serves the demand of people on Earth, whether that's private sector actors, you know, consumers or businesses or public sector actors, or one of the, I think, uh, reasons why people like us, who may not have been interested in space as much before, are drawn to space, why so many people are paying attention, is that there is this promise of a space for space economy, where there are people in space, and there are activities serving their demand. And, you know, it's a little hard to say exactly how much of the current space economy or current space activity is driven towards that. But some of it clearly is. I mean, the launch activity, habitat activity, even manufacturing, even resource utilization, you know, that is all pointing towards the time when we hope there will be people up in space who want their demands supplied, uh, whether they're settlers in the very long run or tourists, hopefully, in the more near term. So, so from an economics perspective, I've got an example that I want to share. You know, the agriculture industry or, or the entire market, it's got its own typical problems. You know, some of them are now have been, been able to be solved by Earth observation and others by new technology, innovations who want to utilize the same sort of principles to be able to do that in space. Uh, you know, nutrition in their habitat or spacecraft you know, agriculture, vertical farming and, and such. But do you think that that's, that's part of the space market or, or space commerce? Or is it just applying innovation made for space travel that's being used on Earth, you know? Yeah, interesting. So vertical farming. So there's a couple of different categories there. So Earth observation is literally activity done in space for use on Earth. Vertical farming is stuff invented, say, or things like this, might be invented for use in space and then brought to Earth. Uh, I had a student who was studying remote surgery applications, which NASA was involved in early on for similar sorts of reasons. We might need to do this in space someday, and then turns out super useful for rural medicine on Earth. I guess I would tend to, let me just say, it's always very hard for economists, or I should say policy analysts, to draw lines between sectors. And in fact, that's an area of some danger because, of course, industries like to say we are a X billion dollar, trillion dollar industry. And given that the economy is, of course, interconnected in infinite ways, in some sense, we are all, you know, 50 trillion dollar sectors. Like they're all, they're all pieced together. They're all together. So where do you draw these lines? I would tend to say that there are technological spillovers or, you know, applications of space technology if they're purely on Earth, it's a little hard for me to call that a space space commerce. I feel like there needs to be some actual connection to activity in space for it to be part of the space economy. And I think that that's, you know, the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the Commerce Department has this new space economy, I forget what it's called, category, basically categorization, because they're trying to get, the U.S. 
governments trying to get a handle on this economy and put it into the way that we think about the intersectoral composition and interactions. And so I think that's another, that's probably a similar line as they would draw. Is there some direct connection to space? Yeah. And a lot of dotted lines being connected when you talk about clustering of, of these sectors that come into play. Curious to know, how would you deconstruct the space commerce and economics to first principles? What are some of the core elements of a functioning market and business when it comes to space? And what do we need first uh, from your point of view? I wrote a paper for the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which was very much aimed at economists and trying to say, you know, you might be interested in space, you're hearing a lot about it. How should we think about this? And so it's a bit abstract. I guess there's maybe two ways to answer your question. How would we deconstruct the sector? One is is sort of where I'm headed, which is this more abstract version. The other is a more concrete version, which maybe we'll get to, which is like, what are the steps that you need for a space economy? At the, at the more abstract level, I guess I would just say markets, one of the beautiful things about markets is that they're largely self-organizing. And so I think the, the first thing you need to do is just get out of the way. I mean, it's, space has been such a public sector driven, centralized sector for so many decades that it's, you know, with exceptions, of course, in the satellite sector and so on, but in terms of human space activity, that it's, it's just been hard for the market to try to self-organize. So the first step, I think, is what I, what I call decentralization. So basically just step aside, support the, the private sector, uh, you know, in terms of buying some of the needs that you, or buying their services to meet some of the needs you have as a public sector, but try to allow them to, to chart their own paths, uh, these companies and entrepreneurs. But I should say that I think there is definitely a role for the government in helping to refine that market. And so that's sort of the second step. So first step is decentralize the market. Second step is refine the market. And that has a lot of pieces. There's basic stuff like Property rights have to be clear, rule of law has to be guaranteed, dispute resolution, the kind of standard stuff that we need for institutional support of markets. But then also, you know, markets are imperfect in many ways. And and some of those are ways that they that markets can have negative effects on society. Some of those are ways in which markets just need a little help to achieve really all they can achieve, positive types of externalities. And so the government can get involved in various ways in supporting it in that way. So I think those are the first two steps that we need in sort of an abstract sense. So that brings me to a, a bit more of a niche question, which is what would be the, some of the key drivers that would be required to establish the market? So, you know, scale, people, transportation to space. Rockets are very risky and inefficient and, um, you know, not very comfortable to travel with. So if we can get 10 people per week to the orbit, which is in close proximity per se, that will result in 500 passengers per year based on some of the some of the data out there. So how can a space economy be established because rockets <laughs> rockets seemingly don't scale? You know, we can't scale them any further now. We need a space elevator. That's the answer, right? That's, <laughs> the, it's always, it's always the answer. I had some students write a case on the space elevator idea, which is the one that it's the idea that causes space people to roll their eyes the fastest if you if you try to suggest something fun. But you're right. I mean, look, space is hard. It's hard to get a lot of people up in space. I don't know if the 500 number, well, I guess I would say, let me step back. I think one of the risks in space, because we have a tradition that started with something like Apollo, where we have like a super clear goal, we know the steps, we draw a roadmap, we hit it in 10 years. I think there's a little bit of a danger of thinking that way about it. And if this is instead going to be a market, it's going to be an economy, a little bit more hands off in terms of how exactly it develops, I think is important. The market will find, markets find their ways to growth in ways that we can't always foresee. You know, the, the number of people example you just said, who knows, right? It, maybe this all starts with lots of suborbital tourism and it's a few minutes in space. It's not much. Then gradually people want to spend a little more time up in orbit. And so then they want a cup of coffee because, you know, people like coffee. Uh, and it just gradually, it gradually builds. And it, it's not people living on the moon for 200 years. Who knows, right? I mean, maybe it's people on the moon in 15 years. I'm not sure exactly where that would head. But I guess I would be nervous about charting too specific a path. I mean, I should say, of course, some of the key ingredients that you mentioned 
have been clear for decades. You've got to have low cost access to space. You've got to get people up in space to demand these sorts of things like we talked about at the beginning. You've got to have ways to preserve their health. So radiation shielding, other life support. Um, presumably you're going to need some sort of ability to construct things in space uh, because it's tricky to get things up in space, not just because of the mass, but because of the uh, violence of launch. So it's nice to be able to build things up there. So, you know, there's some basic ingredients we're going to want, but I wouldn't want to get too specific, I think, about exactly how that happens. So you mentioned Space Elevator. We are our first uh, actual um, episode on this podcast was on Space Elevator. So well, there you go. <laughs> so it's good to see. But here's a question for you. Uh, in terms of rockets, do you think SpaceX will be able to reach the scale that, that we're talking about, the 500 mark, the 500 number? And, and, and going a step further, you know, it was um, having a few people – uh, having that 500 number not be achievable, but having uh, the possibility of having a few of them, you know, stay and starting to reproduce, create some sort of a, of a starting point for an exponential growth curve. It will take a few decades for that population on the moon, which which is the goal of the Artemis program of sustainability from a sustainable perspective to be equal to a U.S. small town. Is, is, this, is this a market that, is in, that you see investable by anybody else other than governments? That's right. It's a fundamentally interesting question, actually, where the capital for space comes from. So we, let's def definitely talk about that. I guess the, the first thing I would say is I don't, I'm not convinced entirely that it's the moon. I, I don't know exactly what it is, uh, where people end up. Right? Okay. And and so maybe Musk is, I mean, SpaceX is such a wild card in all of this. It's really hard to say. I mean, we have become so, in some sense, dependent upon SpaceX for thinking about the biggest possible dreams of space in a way that would have been literally inconceivable a decade ago, uh, much less 20 years ago. Uh, so, so it's, given that there's a lot riding on essentially how far and how fast they push, it's pretty hard to predict. Um, maybe not if you're inside uh, the C-suite at SpaceX, but for those of us on the outside, it's a little harder. So anyways, if Starship really works and we're really sending lots of them to Mars, maybe it's a, a whole different ball game in terms of the number of people and where they are. But take that as it may, the, the broader question you have, which is, you know, uh, you're going to put a small town maybe somewhere in space sometime over the next century. Who's paying for that and why is an excellent question and one that I think everyone in the sector has to think hard about. It's definitely not traditional venture capital. I guess that's the first thing I'd say, which is traditional venture capital's horizon is very short. I mean, very short relative to the needs of space. Um, and so it's just a, probably not the right vehicle for that. Now, I'll say a, maybe an asterisk on that in a little bit. So if, but if we're looking for other places uh, from which the capital can come, I guess there are a few options. So the first is government, which of course is the traditional place you might look for kind of long horizon investments. I think the problem for, with that is that governments are made to serve their populations and their populations live here. And so, you know, if I were a politician and I said, look, I'd really like to spend a couple trillion dollars establishing a new small town on Mars in a hundred years, I think my voters would not be particularly receptive. It just is not the way they want to spend the money. So I'm not sure governments are actually the most logical place to look for that. Governments are great for science and for other versions of long horizon investments, but they need to be serving the people on earth and, and their needs, I think in most cases. So, so then where are the other sources of capital? Uh, there are some governments that are looking to diversify their sovereign wealth fund portfolios that just have a lot of money. And space is probably an unusual asset class. It's not correlated to just about anything else I can imagine. And uh, very high risk, maybe very high return. So you can imagine some institutional money making its way in, uh, both from sovereign wealth funds and perhaps from institutions like universities or pension funds that have essentially indefinite horizons or infinite horizons. And then of course the big uh, question is, uh, well, I guess two other sources. One is billionaires, and we're very fortunate that the t world's two richest people are space enthusiasts. 
I don't know if that will last. I would predict, in fact, that it won't just be the two of them, that, that we are in an era where many people with a lot of personal resources will see this as a way to, you know, um, invest in a legacy for them. And I, I think that that's a big part of, of what's going on. And that's perfectly reasonable. Everyone, this is getting very philosophical very fast, but everybody fears death. Everybody wants immortality. And one way to think about that is investing in something that will outlive you. And that's what's often been the case, whether it's through children or you know, academics, through your writing. For billionaires, investing in space might not be such a bad bet on that dimension. Um, and they really can have then extremely patient uh, capital. And then I, I guess I'd just say two, and this is a long answer, but I'd say two quick other things. One is, are the broader capital markets going to actually embrace this sort of investing? That's a, a big question mark. Obviously, there's been a lot of excitement about space with SPACs and ETFs and other things lately. It could be kind of a fad. We'll have to see. Um, but it's great that the markets more broadly are getting interested. That's, I think, a good thing for space. And then the last thing I'd say is this asterisk on the um, VCs, which is that getting back a little bit to your question of how do we get to this space economy, given that it's hard to predict that path, you know, a chain of seven year investments that seem incremental, that can build up to something much greater over time. And so even if it doesn't seem like a long horizon, I think it's positive to get the VC money in there. And that brings me to, um, you know, try to figure out the, the, the similarities between establishment of the space market and back in the 70s, 80s and 90s, the telecom and IT market. You know, there's, mm. is there anything that you, you, you believe or you think that could be taken as, a, as an analogous approach that was taken back then to establishment of those markets in the space market? So unfortunately, I'm not really an expert in either of those uh, histor historical markets. I guess the one thing, a couple things pop into my mind, maybe. So, so one is that both of those were serving very clear demands, hmm. right? So yeah, yeah. information processing and communications have been central to economic activity of humans since, you know, the beginning of time. Uh, and again, space is searching for that a little bit, right? What exactly are we doing that is so important? Uh, and of course, to the extent that space is doing IT and telco <laughs> through satellites, that's where you see all the activity in space because that's a clear demand. The thing people talk about, which gets back to people, is that there's also this innate human desire to explore, to found new things, to try new ways of living. So if that's actually a market that space can serve in a way that exploration served before, great. Uh, maybe there's an analogy in that sense. And we haven't really had much ability to do that for quite some time on Earth. I mean, the age of exploration is now quite a while ago. Uh, I guess the, the only other thing I would say, which is a little trickier, is that um, the, the uh, IT and telco sectors Though there were lots of fits and starts uh, along the way, I think there wasn't a there wasn't a fundamental question about whether or where the end game was. Like people were excited about where we were headed. With space, it's a still a little less clear. I think whether the dreams of some of the people, probably all the people who listen to this podcast, are in fact shared by enough people that will end up there, or whether it's a little bit more of a still science fiction. All right. Well, that's fair. And it kind of um, brings me to a more uh, academic question because I kind of want to shift the gears a little bit and talk about industrial economics and space and what, get your perspective on that. Do you think the principles, learnings of industrial economics, such as, you know, we were talking about it earlier when you jumped on the call, oh, Telling's Law, uh, Bertrand's competition model, uh, monopoly theory will apply in space. Um, you know, specific principles are applicable on uh, on a smaller scale, but not in a general manner. The one that caught my attention when you just went through that quick list is monopoly. So one thing that is definitely, well, that I feel is definitely at play in space and will be, uh, is that it's it's 
maybe increase maybe decreasingly so but it's still a pretty high fixed cost sector i mean not if you want to do cubesats or nanosats there's that's great that we've dropped the fixed cost for satellite activity but for the big stuff we're talking about launch manufacturing in space resource utilization stuff like that that's still a big upfront investment moreover a lot of the business models we talk about in terms of these grander visions for the space economy are very interdependent. Uh, so you only have people to serve in space when launch is working, but launch only makes sense when you think that there are people who you might want to serve in space. It's all very much of a piece. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that's a, that's a sector in which there's sort of uh, natural monopoly features, uh, large economies of scale, at play. And in particular, you might think that vertical integration and even horizontal integration is a natural thing to see a lot of within space. And we may worry about that, right? I mean, I was uh, speaking with a uh, an acquaintance who's in the space finance um, area of the space economy, and, and he said whenever someone comes to him pitching a new idea for a company, uh, he always says, okay, but how do you get around SpaceX, right? So why won't they just do this like a month after you start doing it and do it better and faster? And I think that's a real question. Um, how will that happen? And, and you know, that maybe that's not the worst thing. So like monopolies obviously have costs. On the other hand, <laughs> uh, some companies that end up being monopolies get there because they do incredible things incredibly efficiently. So we will have all those tensions to manage in space just like we do on earth and that's a and that's a good point because it kind of highlights a perspective that might have occurred or that might have been very similar to in the 2000s with microsoft and and the key concept or at actually the way that they were they found their way to weasel out of that was 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 even putting a higher a bigger bet and and doubling down essentially. So, do you think that there is a possibility that because the space market is so underdeveloped per se, there is a possibility of of that also happening? The idea that SpaceX could be such a beast that it would become untamable, in a manner of speaking, you know. Or the idea that you have the SpaceX and the Blue Origins of the world becoming so beastly that they become, you know, uh, untamable, that you have mergers and acquisitions on left day, right day. Right now you have SPACs, but, you know, the next term could be mergers and acquisitions. What do you think? Yeah, yeah it's, an excellent, it's an excellent question. And I will say that the earthly society is going through quite an interesting moment in antitrust theory right now. I mean, just to, for, to be clear to listeners, I am not actually a IO or antitrust economist, but sometimes I pretend to be uh, in, when I'm teaching in class. And the world is going through a fascinating moment in antitrust where, a little bit of a tangent here, but um, antitrust a century ago, when it sort of first got started, had a bias against big. So there was, there was a school of thought you might even think of as just big is bad. We're not even sure why, but we just know there will be problems if people get, if companies get too big. There was a real revolution in the way that antitrust was thought about in the middle of the 20th century, often associated with the Chicago School of Economics, that was really much more narrowly focused on proving specific harms of monopolies. And so you wouldn't break up a company or take other actions unless you could show that consumers were being harmed by their market power. And now there's a bit of a pendulum swing back towards those earlier visions of antitrust, prompted, of course, by the Googles, Amazons, Facebooks of the world that seem to have a new sort of control that, that people get nervous about. So uh, coming back to space, I'm not sure which kind of antitrust we will want to apply to something like SpaceX or Blue Origin or the few others, because, you know, one thing that's tough with tech anything that's high tech, which space certainly is, is that, you know, in the further distant past, when it was very physically intensive technology, we tended to think there were lots of barriers to entry. And so once you establish a position, it was really hard for somebody to blow past you. And you even just think of railroads. We, our more recent experience with tech, like Microsoft, for instance, is that there's 
constant innovation and challenges to the leading tech companies. And of course, that's the defense that Google and Facebook use now. Like, come on, we're, you know, the competition is a click away. So what's the big problem? I'm not sure exactly where space is in that. I mean, clearly it's got the high physical investment of sort of the older brand of tech, but software is also a huge part of what's going on. And a lot of activity in space is in fact building off of the revolution in microelectronics. So I guess we're just going to have to see. Um, <laughs> one, one wrinkle, of course, is that I think everyone is just so grateful, basically, that that SpaceX and Blue Origin and these other companies are trying, mm -hmm. right, are trying to push the frontier that thinking of pulling them back for some antitrust reason just seems way premature. Like, let's just let them go and see what they can do. And then we'll worry about that later. I think it's probably the attitude of most people in the sector at this point. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, in our in our age um, of rapid, 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 rapid globalization, there are a number of industries that have attained global economies of scale. You know, that's and that's 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 the big caveat there. Um, can same be said? Do you think that can can the same be said for space and or will we remain for the most part hyper local for our future colonies? <laughs> This is very speculative. Um, <laughs> if you look at the space companies, some space companies that even that we haven't talked about, they're inherently, with the asterisk about geopolitics, constrained by geopolitics, <laughs> they are as global as you can be. Right. Yeah. So, of course, the geopolitics always get messy with space. But think about a company like Spire, which I don't know how much yeah. time you guys have spent thinking about, but of course, ISU connection is strong with Spire, as is the HBS connection, because Peter Platzer is an alum of both. And, you know, Spire, from the start, uh, has thought of its reach as global. And I think that space is inherently global in that way. Will space colonies be intercolonial uh, in the same way? I, I assume so. I just, I mean, it's hard to imagine going back, in some sense, to a more local view when we're going out. But I don't know. That's an interesting question I haven't given a lot of thought to. Yeah, and then you know, I had a lot of sub questions there. You know, I, will we see a new age of globalization, uh, yeah. <laughs> solar systemization right. in the near future, right? right? Uh, and what does this right. mean for economies of scale in general? Yeah, well, that would be great, right? I mean, I well, I guess it depends on your attitude towards globalization. I mean, I, I'm economists generally are pretty pro globalization uh, ever since Adam Smith, at least. So. Uh, I, you know, I think it would be wonderful if space could knit together the different economies of Earth in a way that we all we have tended to hope that it will. So, so now I just want to make it clear to our listeners: now we're moving into the futuristic economies uh, perspective, and and the next question about uh, blockchain, NFT, FT for raw materials mined and and produced in space, uh, smart contracts to handle far off robotic process automation on alien worlds. What do you think about, about the future <laughs> of, of economy from this perspective? <laughs> well, that's okay. So I will, I, I don't, I don't know if I have anything smart to say about the connection of blockchain to this, what I, or NFTs or anything like that. What I will say is that, uh, more, the more contracting and the more, you might think of futures, forwards, other derivative contracts on various activities in space that can actually give a price to somebody who thinks they have an idea for a business, the better. And, you know, the, the, the one example that might be familiar to most listeners is when ULA put a price on water on the moon, right? They said, like, if you can deliver it, we'll buy it. Now, yeah. that didn't happen, but, you know, that would be, that's the kind of thing that will, I think really spur this sort of activity to happen. And, and fortunately, markets are pretty good at figuring out ways to contract between willing parties. So I would expect that whatever technological form that takes, it'll be a big part of actually making progress in this. Excellent. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about the potential of having boundaries on uh, the, or the boundaries of free markets. Do you think we need to establish a new kind of international commerce, trade institutions to build a framework for this business in space? Well, I don't think we need to yet. Uh, I mean, the, the, the funny thing about the Outer Space Treaty, though it's limited in many ways, I mean, in some ways, it's a miracle that it exists, that, yeah. that 
during the height of the, of the early days of the space race, everybody sat down and came up with something pretty good yeah. <laughs> uh, for trying to govern this in a completely uncertain environment about where we were headed. So, and I say pretty good in the sense that I think they had the foresight to say, the one thing we know kind of how to do is to have states relate to each other in this international context. And so if you're going to license activity, government uh, X, you are responsible for that activity and its effects on everybody else. And so that was a very smart thing to do. And so I think, therefore, we will tend to govern economic activity in space through that lens. It'll be a, a sort of funny thing. It'll be space for space activity, but tied to the earthly infrastructure institutionally. As the space for space economy gets developed, the people actually doing that work up in space will start to feel, I'm sure, hamstrung by those sorts of institutional inter uh, relationships, which of course has been fodder for a great deal of science fiction writing <laughs> over the years about claiming independence and breaking free of the shackles of earthly institutions. So I'm sure that at some point we will need new international, or I guess it'll be interplanetary trading and institutions. I think we are quite a ways away from needing to worry about building those at this point. But um, but yeah, at some point we'll need to. I guess we're taking the right steps because you know you'll you'll soon be publishing a new case study from HBI on Made in Space. You know, and just came case, out actually. Oh, it did it. It's okay. available now. Yep. There you go. Case study available now. Uh, I, I I have yet to read it, so thank you for for sharing that. But yes. um, what is your view on in space manufacturing that might have been already mentioned in the case study? Yes, I hope you know any listener who's interested in reading about space. We do have now a few. You know, several case studies on the HBS um, publishing website and more will be coming because we're learning about this as, as all of you are. And one thing about HBS case studies you should know is that they don't pick positions. So if you're going there looking for like my view of what is going to happen, it's not that. It's more of a facts. You know, what's what's going on? How do we tell the story of this company? So listen to podcasts, I guess, for people's actual views. Um, on in-space manufacturing, this is one of those things that has been incredibly frustrating, I think it's fair to say, for everybody in the space sector for decades, in the sense that from the very beginning, the idea that there would be something we could make in space, that you could make so much better in space than you could make on Earth, and therefore would drive a huge push for investment in the space economy. That vision, that dream has just not arisen, right? We haven't found something yet that is in fact that much better when it's made up in space. And of course, whenever you say that, you always, someone always says, well, maybe we will find out tomorrow that in fact, <laughs> we have discovered that thing that we can make better in space. And so I, of course, I hope that's true. Um, th but I will say that therefore my view of in-space manufacturing has migrated over time from, we're looking for that really special product to, this is a technology we're going to need for the space for space economy. And, and so the, the made in space case that we wrote very much follows that trajectory in the sense that we talk about the early days of, of in space manufacturing visions. We talk about the early days of made in space where they built wrenches and, or they printed wrenches and things like that in space. And then we talk about a big, the big idea of a fiber optic cable or ZBLAN as it's called. And maybe that's like the killer product to make in space. And, you know, it has potential, maybe it will still turn out that way, but it's also very far from clear that there's a fantastic business case. I mean, it's just still very unproven that, that it's that much better at scale to make a ton of money on it up in space. And then you see that space, that made in space, uh, now part of Redwire, of course, gets this huge contract uh, from NASA to do this thing called Arcanaut, which is basically building structures or printing structures or... Um, creating structures in various ways in space for use in space. And I feel like that's, you know, that's really the frontier that's going to end up mattering is can we build things up there and therefore revolutionize the way we think about satellites, structures that support life, because you can do so much more if you can build it up there than if you have to launch it in pieces. With this new sort of innovation coming to life as slowly, 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 
what do you think about 3D printing, closed loop circular economy? Will every household have their own Star Trek-esque 3D printer for food, medicine and drugs, uh, clothes? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> and, and do you think this is going to implode uh, the economy on Earth? <laughs> 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 that is a great question. So I, I should I didn't say this at the beginning, but the whole reason I was, you know, when I started seeing what was happening with SpaceX and Blue Origin and then got into space is because, you know, my dad raised me on a steady diet of Star Trek Next Generation. So I, I have that's the, those are the deep roots of all of this. Um, so the replicator, yes, it, it poses all sorts of problems for economists uh, if we can ever get it. I. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I should even say not just economists, philosophers. I think the whole notion of, of what it means to lead a good life would be challenged by a replicator at some deep, deep level. But, um, you know, I, I guess I just don't worry yet. I think we have so far to go um, before we actually reach a point at which scarcity is gone which of course that's the big thing that happens in star trek right like they basically they don't need anything anymore because they can produce it and so or they can replicate it uh we're so far from that interestingly you know there's a big debate i think within economics and philosophy and so on we don't have the replicator but our, our productivity with natural resources has increased unbelievably in the past several hundred years has it made us better off Right. So like, are we happier people? Are we more fulfilled people? This is not exactly a space question, although, you know, in some ways they all are. Um, it's hard for economists to believe that we aren't at some fundamental level much better off than we were 500 years ago as humans right? before all the technological innovation we've had. OK, so so uh, let me change yeah. the scope from the, the West and come to the East. Is there a new industrial revolution or just a market for outsourcing labor and resource extraction as East Asia has been old for the old, for over the last 50 years. How I'm asking this um, is from a from a perspective of understanding the, the resource extraction component that, that you just touched upon. So whatever happens in space, it needs to serve Earth's population. And, and what do you think, what are your thoughts on that? The economics of resource extraction from space for Earth aren't great, right? So um, now there may be some very rare elements up there that we can bring back that would be useful down here mm -hmm. and would be cheap enough for us to do that with. But as far as I can tell, just about everything else it's really expensive to go get it and bring it back. And it wouldn't, it just wouldn't work uh, for a business case. You know, when people talk about platinum or platinum group metals or things like that, that are super heavy. I mean, underneath your question is this point that, you know, it's going to, anything like that's going to have to serve the earth economy because that's where all the people will be. And I guess that, that very much depends on what you think we're doing in this resource extraction. I, I tend to think of resource extraction in space as being kind of for space rather than for Earth. Mm -hmm. In order for a market to be onwards towards growth, it needs to serve some sort of population. Yeah. Now, will this resource extraction be able to serve Earth's population in, 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 a, in, a, in a manner that we don't know yet or we haven't discovered yet? Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I meant to mention actually in the last answer about energy from space, right? This is a longstanding yeah. dream again of folks. And I, you know, from what I hear, uh, Jeff Bezos is pretty interested in this specifically. And there are many people quite excited about this, that, that there is so much energy available if you capture it from space that in fact, it might fundamentally improve our ability to solve some of the big problems facing Earth right now. And even, you know, carbon capture at scale kind of stuff. So, so that's certainly on the horizon. And that would be potentially worth the huge investments that it would cost to make that possible. Uh, are there other unforeseen possibilities of resource extraction? I guess if, I, if they're unforeseen, I don't see them either. And that's fair. And here's a question. It's out, it's out there. What do you think are the space-based quote-unquote killer apps? I've become less 
optimistic that there are killer apps uh, in the sense of we're going to have a ton of activity up in space that serves Earth. I mean, and, and I, I should say, of course, I could be completely wrong. So, so, <laughs> so there's, there's energy from space, which is a big enough market that it would be a killer app. There's also, you know, that when you think about Blue Origin's mission from its start, it's been about moving heavy manufacturing and even potentially resource extraction off Earth, making Earth an eco park, essentially. I mean, that would be fantastic, right? If there's a way that launch gets cheap enough and we can figure out a way to do it, of course, that would be wonderful. And I, I would only celebrate that. Uh, I guess I've just become less convinced that there is something like that in any sort of foreseeable horizon Yeah. versus, versus the killer app, so to speak, being that people just like to explore people think the grass is greener they want to try something new and and that's going to cause some demand for people to go up there and eventually stay up there for some time and that's what's going to actually start building a a bit of a self-sustaining economy excellent now do you see any up-and-comers in the space sector except for the obvious you know uh, the the space debris and in orbit yeah say. that's interesting so i think well I think habitats are absolutely fascinating. So, I mean, Bigelow was a real disappointment in, you know, I was very excited about Bigelow for years and was talking to them about writing a case. And I think everyone thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. So it's too bad that they seem to have hit a maybe permanent wall or at least, you know, very serious one. Um, Axiom's doing great things, uh, as far as I can tell, in, in, pushing that habitat technology forward. And I, I hope that they and others will continue to do that. I think that, uh, in fact, I was just reading a Sierra Nevada press release the other day too, about, you know, their hopes to build these sorts of inflatable habitats. I, I think the, the benefit, the reason I'm so excited about habitats is because if you go way back to an early question, you asked about what are the steps to get us there? And I said, well, we should be careful about being too prescriptive. Nevertheless, it's pretty clear if you want people in space, you got to get them there and you got to be able to keep them there. And so you need launch and you need habitats, everything else, then who knows exactly what it would be. But that's the that's the area I'd be most excited about. I mean, I should say I should say that I, you know, most of our conversation as I think is it should be in some way has been focused on sort of human activity in space that's still not where any of the money is. I mean, so like you mentioned satellite service and space debris, like, of course, if I were advising a VC firm on where to put my money in space, I would be talking about satellites all day because <laughs> that's that's where a lot of the excitement really is still right now for the short term. I'll try to wrap it up in a manner where we, we encompass everything. Or is there such thing as space economics in a context of rational human behavior um, as theory describes it on Earth? You know, uh, if so, where do you see it deviating from the historical approaches to human interactions? And how will we make choices? This is my actual question. How will we make choices differently from living and working in space than we do on Earth? Wow, that's a great question. I love that question. Will humans be fundamentally different because they'll be, or when they are interacting in space, or is human nature in some sense non-local? Um, so my instinct is that humans will be pretty much the same that if you, and, and maybe let me give one nuance to that. If you were to take a random sample of the earth population and put them up in a space colony, I think you'd replicate a lot of what you see on earth. I mean, obviously it would evolve in different ways, but I think humans are largely humans. Um, it won't however, be a random sample. I assume who goes up to space, it will be quite strongly selected in particular ways. And I think that that could fundamentally change how societies work in space. You know, a lot of people who are very excited about space have a libertarian streak pretty strong. And, and so I think part of the excitement about going to space and having space colonies and trying all this stuff is that you could experiment with different ways of doing things. Um, I can imagine the other end of the spectrum also being excited about space. So rather than, you know, a sort of libertarian paradise, you can imagine sort of a collective paradise, almost the utop like the utopian movements of, you know, 
a century ago where people try to break through some of the historical inequities and everything that we've built up on earth and start over from scratch on a more even playing field. I can easily imagine things like that. So that to be, to me, those possibilities as an economist are some of the most exciting, you know, what, how could we reinvent how society works uh, across lots of different uh, options and, and see what we learn in a way that you really will never be able to given all the historical baggage that we bring with us on earth. From a wrap-up point of view, I want to know, in the in the world of economists, what is the strongest disagreement about the future of space economy at the moment? Or if there is a disagreement? There, are, there aren't that many economists working on space, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I would say that economists who spent more time on space tend to be a bit more cynical or skeptical, I guess you'd say, of the broader visions of space. And they tend to say, you know, talking too much about space settlement and things like this is not just maybe a waste of time <laughs> for fun, but it can also be a distraction that if we really want to make the most out of space for human flourishing, we should focus on the stuff we actually know how to do, which is make satellites better, make solve the debris problem, you know, things like that, that will actually, you can imagine them in the short term. Uh, whereas I think that there are other I don't know if they're just economists, but I would say other people who think about these broader issues in space and the future of space who still want that dream to be a key part of the dialogue that we have because it draws people in, it draws capital in, and it, it in fact is deeply important that we get that right. Like assuming we do someday end up in space as a society, thinking ahead of time about how we want to do that is absolutely crucial to not screwing up that one opportunity we have. So I think that's a pretty fundamental debate that's still there. All right. So I ask uh, all of our guests a wrap-up question. Uh, what is your answer to why humans should go to space and why space? Yeah. So I think this is a good question to ask anybody who is interested in space. Uh, and so I have a, a way of thinking about it that I'll, that I'll share. So I'd like to say that I think we're going to space for three reasons. So the first is we're going for ourselves <laughs> uh, in the sense that space is absolutely essential to the modern economy. I mean, I don't have to explain that to people listening to this podcast. So we are active in space because it makes our everyday lives much better. I think we're also going to space. The second reason is we're going for our kids, uh, like our direct descendants in the sense that there are a lot of big problems that we will probably be able to solve much better if we leverage space. So whether that's climate change or even just the management of, of natural disasters, uh, even if climate change weren't making them worse, uh, much less other goals that we have for improving the next generation's life, even through peace and, and resolving geopolitical problems and national security. And then I think the third reason is you know, our grandchildren and beyond, so to speak. So we're going there because if we are really trying to chart a brighter and more exciting and, you know, full of flourishing future for our descendants, space is, an, is the last frontier, right? It's the place where we can really dream big about that for, for many generations hence. Well, Matt, I gotta say, this has been a fantastic conversation. Insights, jokes, laughs, fun times, all in all. So thank you so much for being here and, and sharing this time with us. And we sincerely appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, thanks for doing this podcast. It's a great service to everybody. So it's a pleasure to join you guys. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Space Forward. Stay tuned for more deep dives explorations and journeys we have in store for you follow us on spotify subscribe on apple Podcasts, or youtube hear you next time <laughs>